Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we are going to begin our series on the Savage Reavers of the Sea, we all know of as the Ironborn. This series will most definitely require multiple videos, as the material in both the books and the World of Ice and Fire is some of the densest in the series. Since there is no better place to start than the beginning, we are going to start our analysis by discussing some of the history as we know it, and delve into some of the legends and writings that are available regarding who the Ironborn were and where they came from. In other words, Ironborn Origins. So, let's do this. War was an Iron Man's proper trade. The Drowned God had made them to reeve and rape, to carve out kingdoms and write their names in fire and blood and song. So, who exactly are these people that were made to reeve, rape, carve out kingdoms, and write their names in fire and blood and song? Well, in order to understand who the Ironborn are, we have to first understand who they were. And even more importantly, where they came from. The very first line in the Ironborn chapter of the World of Ice and Fire poses a very interesting question. Were the first men truly first? Most maesters would tell you that they were, and the Ironborn are simply first men that happened upon the Iron Islands. But is that actually true? Well, it's possible, but definitely begs the question as to where the sea stone chair and possibly even the Greyjoy seat Pike, came from. No one, including the Ironborn, knows where either of them came from. This brings us to Maester Kurth, who, at the very least, partially rejected the notion that the first men were first, and put forth his own theory as to where the Seastone Chair actually came from. A possibility arises for a third race to have inhabited the Seven Kingdoms in the Dawn Age. Maester Kurth, in his collection of Ironborn legends, Songs the Drowned Men Sing, has suggested that the sea stone chair was left by visitors from across the Sunset Sea. But there is no evidence for this, only speculation. Now, before we move forward, it should be noted that Kurth's treatise was called Songs the Drowned Men Sing, which essentially means that what he was putting forth came directly from the drowned priests and their most loyal followers. In other words, what he was telling you was what the Ironborn would tell you if you asked them where the sea stone chair came from. They would tell you that it was made by their ancestors who came to the Iron Islands from across the Sunset Sea. There was also an archmaester who studied the Ironborn that came to a similar conclusion, but took it one step further and completely dismiss the idea that the Ironborn descend from the First Men. Archmaester Herrig once advanced the interesting notion that the ancestors of the Ironborn came from some unknown land west of the Sunset Sea, citing the legend of the Sea Stone Chair. The throne of the Greyjoys, carved into the shape of a kraken from an oily black stone, was said to have been found by the first men when they first came to Old Wick. Herrig argued that the chair was a product of the first inhabitants of the Isles, and only the later histories of maesters and septons alike began to claim that they were in fact descended of the first men. But this is the purest speculation, and in the end, Herrig himself dismissed the idea, and so must we. Now, we do realize that both Kurth and Herrig's quotes included a final line that dismisses the information that's provided, but both of those quotes came from Archmaester Gildane, otherwise known as George, who, as we've mentioned several times before, 
came up with approximately eight times more words than he had page space for in the world of ice and fire. And since he decided that these sidebars needed to be in there, the information within them seems like something that we should be making note of. Especially since we are entirely convinced that when reading the world of ice and fire, whenever the maesters give us information, then immediately dismiss it, we pretty much circle it, star it, and highlight it, knowing full well that it's something that we should be paying attention to. Herrick's notion also appears to have been corroborated by the fact that the Maesters claimed to know that there were men living where Old Town now sits before the first men came to Westeros. When speculating about what could have happened to the builders of the fortress on Battle Isle, Yandel puts forth the idea that those who built the fortress might have been the descendants of, quote, the seafarers and traders who settled at the top of Whispering Sound in earlier epics. The men who came before the first men. So, that makes for three separate maesters that all concluded that the first men were not first, with both Kurth and Herrig indicating a belief that these first inhabitants of the Iron Islands came from unknown lands across the Sunset Sea. There's also another alternative explanation as to where the Ironborn came from that has been put forth by one of the most famous drown priests in history, who happens to also be the very first character mentioned in the Ironborn section of the World of Ice and Fire, Sauron Salttongue. Now, Sauron is obviously a very interesting and telling name for George to choose for one of the most famous drown priests in the history of the Iron Islands. As most of you probably already know, in The Lord of the Rings, Sauron was the Dark Lord of Mordor slash all-seeing evil eye demigod that mankind was fighting to prevent from achieving world domination. This being the very first character George introduces us to in the Ironborn section of the World of Ice and Fire definitely sets the tone for the section, and obviously doesn't bode well for the Ironborn. In our story, the drowned priests will tell you that the Ironborn are a race apart from the common run of mankind. Or, as Sauron Salttongue famously stated, We did not come to these holy islands from godless lands across the seas. We came from beneath those seas, from the watery halls of the drowned god, who made us in his likeness and gave us dominion over all the waters of the earth. Note that he included all water in the drowned god's domain, not just the seas. Just about every maester dismisses these and other claims, such as the commonly believed notion among the Ironborn that they are closer kin to fish and merlings than common men, as ludicrous, which admittedly seems a logical thing to do, until you take a look at the Grey King's legend. On the Iron Islands, everyone but the Good Brothers are descended from the Grey King, with House Good Brother descending from the Grey King's brother. According to his legend, the Grey King took a mermaid to wife, so his sons and daughters would have the choice as to whether they wanted to live on land or sea. That seems to give some credence, or at the very least, a logical explanation for the drowned priest's claims, but that would still make them equally man and fish. That is, unless the Grey King was also a hybrid of some sort. So, let's take a look at the Grey King's legend and see what this guy's deal is. The Grey King was a lot more than just the legendary progenitor of the Iron Islands. His legend makes him out to be more of a demigod king, especially when considering the fact that he ruled for 1,007 years which obviously seems awfully godlike. Within his legend are two vitally important pieces of information that really drive this point home. The first is the fact that he was said to have killed Naga, who was the world's largest ever sea dragon. A sea dragon that was large enough to swallow krakens and leviathans whole and drown entire islands in her wrath. Okay. So let's think about what accomplishing something like that would actually require, since it does seem extremely likely that he actually did do this, 
considering the fact that Naga's ribs are still on the hill where he built his hall. Killing the world's largest ever sea dragon would most likely require him to win a battle with a monster that's probably bigger than a football field in the water. A man couldn't do such a thing, which almost certainly seems to imply that he wasn't a man, or at least wasn't a normal man. The second huge implication that comes from this aspect of his legend is the fact that he must have been enormous, which is actually backed by the fact that Aaron Dampere flat out said that men are smaller now than they used to be, and also that the Grey King built his legendary throne out of Naga's jaws. Now, I'm not even going to pretend to know how big the world's largest ever sea dragon's jaws were, but I can say with virtual certainty that my six-foot frame wouldn't fit in a throne that large. In fact, I'd probably have to do some pretty serious climbing just to get into it. And when I did, I'd probably look like a newborn baby sitting in the thing. The second point of emphasis that really drives home the point that the Grey King was no ordinary man is the fact that at the end of his 1,007-year reign as King of the Iron Islands, he cast aside his driftwood crown and walked into the sea, descending to the drowned god's watery halls to assume his quote-unquote rightful place at his right hand. Historically speaking, being at the right hand denotes a special place of honor. For instance, in Christianity, Jesus sits at the right hand of his father, which to us implies that the Grey King taking his rightful place at the right hand of the drowned god signifies a very special relationship between the drowned god and the Grey King, possibly that of father and son. This brings us to Archmaester Herrig's assertion as to why the Seven never took root in the Iron Islands where he stated that it was because the Drowned God was there first, and went on to refer to the Drowned God as the quote-unquote creator of the seas and father of the ironborn. Okay, so that seems to flat-out confirm that the Grey King is the Drowned God's son. The legends of the ironborn state that they are all the ancestors of the Grey King and his brother, which in turn means that in order for the Drowned God to be the father of the Ironborn, he would have to be the father of the two legendary progenitors of the Iron Islands, thus explaining why the Grey King marched into the sea to take his rightful place at his father's right hand. So, with all of that in mind, what was the Grey King? He seems to have been huge, capable of entering the sea and slaying sea dragons, making the sea dragons living fire his thrall, and he ruled for 1,007 years. All of this seems to point to him being a demigod of some sort. This brings us to Maester Theron, who was born a bastard on the Iron Islands. Theron noted a certain likeness between the black stone of the ancient fortress on Battle Isle in Old Town and that of the sea stone chair, the high seat of House Greyjoy of Pike, whose origins are similarly ancient and mysterious. Theron's rather inchoate manuscript, Strange Stone, postulates that both fortress and seat might be the work of a queer, misshapen race of half-men, sired by creatures of the salt seas upon human women. These Deep Ones, as he names them, are the seed from which our legends of Merlings have grown, he argues, whilst their terrible fathers are the truth behind the Drowned God of the Ironborn. Okay, so what the hell does that mean? This is obviously some extraordinarily abstract shit we're dealing with here. So let's try to break this down into a few easy-to-understand equations and sort of if-then logic-proof this out. It says that there are creatures of the sea that are the truth behind the drowned god of the Ironborn. So let's just call these creatures what they are. They're the drowned god. 
These creatures are said to have fathered half-human children on human women that are called deep ones. So, the drowned god plus a human woman equals a deep one. It then goes on to say that the deep ones are the seed from which the legends of Merlings grew, which in turn would mean that the deep ones equal Merlings. Now, let's combine that with what we think we know about the Grey King. Given that it appears that the drowned god is the Grey King's father, that would, in turn, make the Grey King a deep one. So, if the Grey King is a deep one, and a deep one is the same thing as a merling, that would also make the Grey King a merling. And since he is the only deep one slash merling that we know of that also happens to have been a king, that would make the Grey King the Merling King. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking that we're crazy, and the rest of you are probably wondering who the hell the Merling King is. But before you decide that we're completely out of our minds, consider this. Dagon is the name of one of H.P. Lovecraft's most famous Deep Ones, and it also happens to be a very prominent name on the Iron Islands which is exactly where we'll be picking up next time.